Hey, it's Professor Rich, and I'm going to do a couple of videos on uh, media. And this is my first one, and I'll follow this up with uh, kind of sort of a history of media, more a theory of the history of media. Um, but right now I want to talk about one of the great myths about American media. And that myth, which is you hear it all the time, is that back in the good old days, the American media was a watchdog, and, and uh, they didn't care about making the politicians happy, and they just went out to try to tell the truth and reveal all the bad guys. Uh, this is sadly not true. Um, the American media uh, has really only been like that for a, maybe a couple of periods in its history, and that was only briefly. Uh, really only one period I'm aware of. I'm, I'm kind of just assuming there was another one. The reality of the American media is, is that for the vast majority of its existence, it has been deeply partisan. That is to say uh, that there were newspapers or, or, or whatever the outlets were that were clearly and overwhelmingly Democratic, and there were newspapers and outlets that were clearly and overwhelmingly Republican. Uh, then we entered into a period of consensus that really starts uh, World War II-ish and, and continues on up until the 80s more or less. And then uh, uh, we've reverted back into a period of extreme polarization. But even the period of consensus it wasn't investigatory particularly. It, they, they weren't going after the politicians. Uh, they were essentially uh, uh, explaining the, the consensus view of things, uh, which meant the mainstream view of things, which meant it was not terribly unsettling. Um, in fact, uh, uh, you know, talking about the, the period of great partisan media, uh, Thomas Jefferson, um, one of the, the bad things he did, and I generally like Jefferson, but he hired a guy, put him on the government payroll, specifically for the purpose of running an anti-federalist uh, newspaper uh, to, to bash Hamilton and his party, um, and he paid him with American tax dollars. And this newspaper had no pretense of objectivity. Of course, Hamilton did the same thing, um, although his guy wasn't being paid for by the public, so I guess that makes it better. Um, but newspapers existed as organs of the party to attack the other guy, uh, which is why a lot of times when people talk about newspapers, they'll refer to a newspaper as being a Democratic or Republican newspaper, because all of them were, all of them, uh, really uh, up until World War II. Now, in World War II, we begin to see consensus because we're at war and we have a common enemy, and we also uh, develop a new type of media, uh, uh, first radio networks and then very quickly after that television networks, and that really changes things. Now, the myth that somewhere along the way, the, or back in the day, good old days, the American media went after the politicians and sought to tell the people the truth, really revolves around one episode in American history. Um, and that's not to say it's the only episode of investigative journalism in American history, but it is certainly the one that, that, that created this myth. And that's, of course, Watergate. But here's what people have, don't understand about Watergate. Um, water, two things you, you may not understand. You might... First off, the two the Watergate, when it first began to be reported, was widely and heavily criticized in every media outlet but the Washington Post. So what would happen is a story would run in the Washington Post suggesting the Nixon administration was up to no good. Then every other newspaper in the country, really led by the New York Times, uh, would bash the Washington Post story because what they were doing is going to their White House sources and saying, hey, are these guys, are they, are they on to anything? And of course the White House is going, no, no, they're terrible, they're lying, they're making it all up. And then the New York Times would run editorials and stories about how awful the Washington Post was and how off they were on their reporting. And really for a long time the media had a field day lambasting the Washington Post and ridiculing them and attacking them because all their sources in the government told them that well, the Washington Post had it wrong because the media worked back then exactly like it works today. The reporters, the anchors, uh, everybody, the editors, everybody, their value was in their ability to get sources, and sources meant people in the government. And you didn't get sources by blowing the whistle and exposing things people in the government were doing. You got sources by uh, you know going and, and getting the information they wanted you to get and running that information, controlled leaks and that sort of thing. And so the Washington Post broke away from that mold, and I'm going to talk about why in just a second, and the rest of the media viciously attacked it um, until it became clear that the Post was on to something, and then the rest of the media all of a sudden acted like they were there all along and, and began running the Washington Post stories and doing their own investigative journalism in the later stages of Watergate. The New York Times actually plays a significant role in investigating and it's on its own. But of course, as you probably all know, the initial investigation was really done by two guys, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. Now, 
why did they do it? If, if this was the model, what were these guys doing? Well, here's what you have to understand. The way you rose to the top of the media game was you had access, you had contacts, you knew people. Well, imagine for a minute that you're a reporter in a situation where you don't have any access, and you don't have any contacts, and you're not really on the fast track to getting them, and uh, maybe you're young, maybe you don't feel like you know, you're fitting in well or things are going well in your career, and you stumble across something. Well, you really have got nothing to lose. You don't have contacts, so you have no contacts to lose. You have no access, so you have no access to lose. So why not run with it? Because what you need to understand is that uh, Bob Woodward had been at the Washington Post for less than a year. He'd only been a reporter for a little over a year. Um, he, he didn't know anybody. His job at that time, at the time of Watergate, was to sit around the courthouse in D.C. overnight and just wait to see if anything interesting happened. You know, like somebody really drunk came in and made a fool of themselves and he could write a little entertaining story about it. And of course, the Watergate burglars came in and that's how he ended up with the story. This was not a man with any power or access in the media. This was a man who saw an opportunity to write a big story and then maybe move up. Now, if he would have, if would have known people in the White House, I bet he wouldn't have written that story. Carl Bernstein didn't have a college degree. He had dropped out of the University of Maryland and had been told uh, repeatedly uh, that he couldn't have certain jobs because he didn't have a college degree and they required a college degree. But he was a hard-working guy and he was an outstanding reporter and he had worked himself into a position where he was writing on the, I believe it was the city desk on the Washington Post. But he wasn't connected. He, he wasn't on the bullet train to the editor's office. These were two guys who had nothing to lose. And so they wrote the story, and that could happen again today. But if these were two guys who were going to White House press briefings, my guess is they don't write the story. It all makes sense if you understand the context of what's going on here. Um, but this, of course, they inspired a generation of people who wanted to be the next Woodward and Bernstein. But where are those people? What happened to them? Do you see them out there today? I certainly don't. Now, there was a few years there where we did some stories into like what the CIA was doing, and there was some great investigative journalism about, say, the expansion of the bombing of Vietnam into uh, Cambodia and Laos uh, by Richard Nixon. But other than that, there wasn't this major revolution in, in the media that turned them all into watchdogs. In fact, look at Woodward's career itself. I mean, Woodward would go on to go and get permission from really powerful, famous people uh, to write their story, kind of their authorized story. I mean... Is it that? I mean, how how much more mainstream can that be? Yeah, I know he includes these little things in there that appear controversial, but he gets permission from all these people, like the recent book on Obama and his book on Bush. He goes and he gets permission to follow them around. It's all in a very tightly controlled setting. Yeah, and there's salacious things in there, but I mean, come on, really look how these books are being written. This isn't high level investigative journalism. Bernstein's been a little more true to, to what he started out doing. Um, uh, doing some actual real investigative stories and breaking some big stories along the way. Uh, so I probably have more respect for him, uh, which is why we don't hear as much about him. Bernstein, by the way, also parlayed uh, uh, the All the President's Men stuff, the Watergate uh, uh, story, into a, a pretty interesting life. He, he was married to Nora Ephraim, the, Ephraim, the, the screenwriter who passed away recently. Um, he dated, uh, well, he, he was also married to the daughter of a British prime minister. Um, and he dated, let's see, i got to check this list here, Bianca Jagger, Mick Jagger's uh, uh, ex-wife, um, Martha Stewart, and Liz Taylor. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, Carl Bernstein dated all those guys, all those girls, excuse me, whoops. Um, also, his son is the lead guitarist for Kesha. I think that's how you say her name, the, the teeny bumper star. Uh, weird tidbits, huh? Anyway, um... Jank, in fact, on the show, will refer to all the time the good old days when journalism was investigative and they went after the politicians. Never happened. Those good old days weren't there. Were there individual stories? Sure. But usually, the mainstream media is not going to look into a scandal like this unless they are forced to. You think about Iran-Contra. You may not know this, but there had been all kinds of leaks coming out, of particularly Middle Eastern media, about Iran-Contra and that it was going on for more than a year before Iran-Contra broke in America. Stories had been showing up in Al Jazeera and these other sources. It wasn't until an airplane crashed and the pilot, uh, in order to try to get out of trouble, said that he was smuggling drugs for the CIA. Bads. <laughs> I mean, encapsulating a lot there, but basically that's what he said. Uh, then it became a big story, uh, but at that point there was nothing the media could do to control it. It, it just kind of blew up on them. Um, in fact, I did a video on that on the Iran Contra Fair. You can look back through TYT history and check it out. Anyway, I just want to try to put to bed this myth 
that back in the day the media was hard hitting and investigative and, and didn't care about access and would you know get after politicians no matter what they said. Completely untrue. Alright, anyway, I'm Professor Rich. Hope you learned something.